So we had discussed last lecture proper names of stars. So the names were based on what do you want to call the star, name of star. There are hundreds, thousands of names of stars. You know, but they, they, on a few of these, you know, pretty much Rigel was, was pretty much agreed upon, Deneb pretty much agreed upon, Betelgeuse, and so forth. When you say serious people know which star you mean. <coughs> Only one star was called Algol. But some of these stars were not terribly unique. For example, Deneb means tail, and a lot of the mythical creatures had tails, and so there were a lot of Deneb's in the sky. In fact, there was one star, Denebula, the tail of the lion. Uh, Rigel means foot, so the Rigel in Orion is a foot, but there was another Rigel in Centaurus, and we call it Rigel Centaurus or Rigel Cantaurus. Uh, they didn't pronounce the C the same way, so we Rigel Cantaurus or Rigel Kent for short. And that's the for the centaur. Okay, so there was some ambiguity with star names. Um, that's why the IU made an official list, but that wasn't done until just a few years ago. So there had to be some other way of designating. In 1603, Johann Bayer, astronomer, publishes a system of star designations. Every star has a two-part name. First part of the name is a Greek letter, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, uh, um, and the second part of the name is the constellation the star is in. So, um, Alpha Origi would be the first star in Origa. Beta or Orionis would be the second star in, in, in Orion. Uh, Gamma Cygni would be the third star in Cygnus. Well, Alpha Cygni would be the first star in Cygnus. Beta Cygni would be the second star in Cygnus. So, so, each, so there's 88 Alphas. And, and so when you give the name of a star, you can't just say alpha, you got to say alpha of which. So there's 88 alphas, there's 88 betas, 88 gammas, and so forth. One for each constellation. And he did this roughly in order of brightness. Now, he kind of goofed a little bit. Uh, the stars of um, Gemini, uh, Castor and Pollux, he got alpha and beta backwards there. Uh, uh, likewise, the stars uh, in Orion. Alpha of Orion, it's supposed to be the brightest star, uh, uh, but he labeled uh, the Alpha star, that's Deneb, he labeled that one Beta, and the brighter star, the second brightest star, which is, is Betelgeuse, he called Alpha. Uh, the star of the Big Dipper, he just labeled right to left, because they were all similar in brightness. Uh, so, but if you, Alpha, Beta, or Gamma, one of the first three letters of the Greek alphabet is one of the brighter stars in a constellation, if you get something on Upsilon or Tau or something that's way down the Greek alphabet, that's going to be a much dimmer star in the constellation. Okay. Um, Latin is one of these, all the names are in Latin, so Latin is one of these languages that has, has genitive cases. So Vega is the brightest star in Lyra, so it's Alpha Lyrae. It's A-E on the end because it's a possessive case. Deneb, brightest star in Cygnus, so it's Cygni, that's possessive case of, of a second declension noun. Uh, Ursa Minor, the small bear, so Polaris is Alpha Ursa Minoris. Uh, Canis Major, the big dog, so Sirius is Alpha Canis Majoris, is the brightest star in, in there. Uh, as again, I get Rigel and Beta. Uh, Rigel Cantaurus, this is the brightest star in Centaurus, so it is Alpha Centauri. That's the name we normally call it by so we don't confuse it with the other Rigel up here. Uh, Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us other than the Sun. Well, rather than writing out the names like this, what we normally do is we assign a, a lowercase Greek letter and then a three-letter official abbreviation. Every constellation has a three-letter abbreviation. So in the in the list of, of constellations I post on, on Blackboard, I've also posted the three-letter abbreviation for all of them. Okay. And so this is how you normally write it. 
Okay, in one of the first labs, you, you uh, the worksheet labs you do, you look at star charts, and so it's helpful to have that list of constellations, so you don't have to write out the whole big name, you just do it like this. Now notice some of the constellations have two capital letters, and lo and lo two capitals and one lowercase letter right there. Okay, uh, unfortunately, um, we're okay. the Greek alphabet, there's the Greek alphabet, uh, um, so in case you don't know what these letters mean, that, that's the Greek alphabet right there, uh, and, and I can also post uh, that for you. Okay. Now, the problem is, the Greek alphabet only goes down to omega. So what does that mean? Well, you can only la label stars that far down. Some constellations, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and you run out of stars that are visible to the naked eye. Other constellations have a lot more stars in them, and you can see all the way to Omega and then more stars. John Flamsteed, uh, astronomer royal, so he was in charge of the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, had another way of doing it. He would take a constellation and then just label the stars from right to left across the constellation, and just one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. So, for example, the star 51 Pegasi. <coughs> That's the 51st star he saw from right to left. Now, every star that Bayer saw, Flamsteed also saw. So that means they have both a Flamsteed number and a Bayer designation. But some stars just have a Flamsteed number because he saw dimmer stars. Well, with small telescopes, you can see even dimmer stars. And so they wanted to name those even dimmer stars. And so this is where uh, another astronomer comes along in the, in the 1800s, uh, Frederick Argelander. Argelander publishes what's called the Bonner's Tschmuckstern. This is the star catalog of Bonn, Germany. And so the Bonner's Tschmuckstern, what he does is, he goes through and he starts one starting point, goes across the sky, labeling stars. Then he changes the altitude of the telescope, the elevation of it, <coughs> points a different angle, starts, label stars. <coughs> so, stars that have labels here also often have Bayer designations and Flamsteed numbers, or sometimes just Flamsteed numbers, or some of them. Nobody saw, I mean, they, they did not have either Flamseed number or Bayer designation prior to that. And so now they have a BD number. And so you'd, you'd write it as BD plus 36 degrees, 2147. That means that Barsus Muckstrung, that's the catalog, angle 36 degrees, star number 2147 from his starting point. It took him a couple of decades to do this but he only got half the sky, the northern half. So a number of years later, astronomers did a southern half the sky, the Cordoba des So a, a CD number star is for the southern part of the sky. And then early part of the 20th century, uh, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory published a multi-volume set, SAO, and then the, which entry numbers, that would be star 101,227 in the SAO catalog. And there's also a Harvard Revised Catalog, Henry Draper Catalog. Uh, the, uh, other astronomers like Marius Wolf made his own little list of, of stars. So you might have Wolf, Wolf 359. So that'll be number 359 in Marius Wolf's list of little dim red stars that no one else cataloged. Uh, and then the Hubble Guide Star Catalog, Hipparchus Catalog from the Hipparchus uh, Satellite. Many, many other different catalogs. So, uh, the star Vega, it's also Alpha Lyrae. So here it is written out, there it is, you know, an abbreviation. It's also 3 Lyrae. Flamsteed numbered it. Okay. It's also got a BD number, an SAO number. It's also listed in the Henry Draper Catalog of Stellar Photometry, the Harvard Revised Photometry. It's got a Hipparchus number, a Tycho number. It even has a different Latin name, Lucinda Lyra, meaning bright star in Lyra, and then an astrophysical data system entry number. 
Okay, this is only a handful of the names that star has. So all these stars have a huge number of names, and so astronomers have to have a database to keep track of all this. Well, a lot of you have heard about these companies that sell star names. Well, that's yet another name that's not actually used by professional astronomers because they're all busy using all these other names right here. And so, uh, uh, so, so the, these are how stars get names. So when you get to the first test, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to have a, a table of data that looks kind of like this. And in this table of data, what you're going to do is, I, I'm going to ask you for which of these stars is the brightest, the dimmest, the hottest, the coolest, which one's closest to us, which one's farthest from us, which one's closest, which one's most like the sun, you know, okay, which one's moving fast in the sky, you know, which one's brightest, you know, etc. You know, which one shines with the most light. That's a lot of information right there. Don't worry if you can't answer that yet, because we haven't covered all that. All we've covered today is how to read this first column, the star name, Fomalhaut. What's Fomalhaut? Fomalhaut's a proper name. Wolf 358, Marius Wolf's list of stars. That's number 358 on his list. 44, it's not and, it's not the, 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 the conjunction, this is Andromeda, 44 Andromeda, 15 Leporis. These are, are Flamsteed numbers. Uh, Lambda Valorum, Psi Ursa Major, Alpha Carini. These are Bayer designations. Uh, Barnes and Muxrum name, name right here. Uh, more Bayer designations down here. SAO catalog name. So this is how you name stars. So what we've done is we've learned now how stars are named. Well, why is this important? Well, in your book, you know, in the lectures, we're going to talk about different kind of stars, and we're going to give the name of the star. And so now you have learned a little bit about how those names work and kind of what those names mean. So that's, that's how we're going to start off the semester, is just getting the background information.